I hope there's an ongoing effort here because I think this is the future of medicine, right? I mean, I think the future of medicine has to be coming up with tools that allow us to take broad sweeping, you know, population based insights and very quickly uh, target individuals. And if we have biomarkers like this that can say, look, the moment this is triggered above a certain level, it doesn't really matter what your glucose is and your insulin might still be normal. This is time to intervene. And then of course, the second part of that equation is what's the right intervention and how do we pair people to the right intervention? Um, and, and and again, you and I have a very similar um, set of experiences, which is um, patients with hyperinsulinemia and elevated glucose generally respond well to carbohydrate restriction. Um, my practice also focuses so much on the role of glucose disposal and non-insulin dependent glucose disposal through exercise. Um, and I know that, um, you know, uh, that that's probably not a surprise to many people is, is sort of correcting the sleep exercise, nutrition trifecta, and then adding to that, the, the role of cortisol in all of this. So I don't know. I, I think this is, I think this is a very hard problem to solve. That's the bad news. But I think the good news is if you get this one right, you get a leg up on every chronic disease. So your yeah, risk of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease all go down. Um, and and so it's worth this enormous effort to, to continue pushing on these questions. And I think, you know, on that note too, you know, and when we talk about individualization and risk prediction before we're seeing our classic you know, biomarker issues come up um, has to do, I'll, I'll circle it back to carbohydrate restriction because we know very low levels of carbohydrate restriction can, you know, reverse the disease process, uh, bring about normal glycemia um, uh, in patients and be able to get them off of medications. But if we could put a risk predictor like POA into wider use, okay, which would give a person their individual carbohydrate threshold, what if it didn't need to be as low? What if we caught them earlier in the disease process and we're like, hey, buddy, you go over, you know, 175, you know, that's where trouble comes in. Rather than, you know, you need to stay very low um, you know, uh, indefinitely because we've caught you on the spectrum of the disease, you know, so late. And this is what we really need to do to control this, to keep your glucose normal without the use of these many medications, especially insulin. I, I want to ask you another question on this, Sarah. Um, and, and again, I don't know if it applies to patients that you've treated with diabetes or those in the pre-diabetes category, but have you have you treated patients for long enough on ketogenic or very low carbohydrate diets who showed up in a state of metabolic disarray ran through a lengthy period of this so you know maybe spent years on a carbohydrate restricted protocol and everything gets better so they, they you know the weight goes along for the ride but obviously and more importantly their metabolic markers improve and they gradually reintroduce some amount of carbohydrate back in the diet. And all of a sudden they're fine. Almost as though you reset them during a long enough period. Uh, how often do you see that? And what do you think is the best explanation for that? See it all the time. And the best explanation for it is what is their insulin reserve? What is their insulin reserve? So, you know, the majority of people um, can go ahead, you know, starting out even at long-standing diabetes, um, reverse their disease, get normal glycemia, um, get off of all their medications, um, and then slowly reintroduce carbohydrates as long as they have functioning beta cells, okay? The problem is, you know, the longer you've had diabetes clearly is a risk factor for this. And we can, you know, we see evidence of that in the bariatric surgery literature as well. I mean, there's been so many studies looking at um, uh, beta cells. Um, but, you know, and the fascinating thing is wh who is getting back some of their beta cell function? In other words, maybe their beta cells were only dormant and were able to, you know, wake them up again versus which are gone and not coming back. I mean, the fact that people were on the incredibly high dose of insulin, okay, 
starting on a very low carbohydrate diet. And then they got better right away, okay? A lot of the change is swift, but they couldn't get off insulin. And it was just years went by, right? And they're just staying on this much lower level of insulin. And then all of a sudden, they come off of it. I mean, we logic would tell us that some sort of beta cell function has returned. It took a long time. Reset the system, help them heal. You know, I mean, we don't completely understand this. There's so many great scientists looking at this right now, but we still don't have a certain answer, you know, because the answers on the personalized level is how many of mine are dormant? How many of mine are dead, right? Yeah. What's it going to take for me to wake these up? You know, if it's impossible, I'd like to know that because that sets expectations ahead of time, right? You can get a lot right. better, but there's always going to be a little insulin in your life. Um, it doesn't mean if they um, are someone who doesn't have any um, insulin uh, production capacity that they can't get a lot healthier, but they may not ever be able to get off of insulin. And so that's where it gets down once again into that nitty gritty personalization aspect. And wouldn't that be nice to know? But I think that the answer to the larger question is, you know, why is this happening that some people can start to eat carbohydrates, not anywhere near to where they were, but they're able to put some back into their diets versus people who can't is um, beta cell function. Um. And I think something in there that you said is very important that I don't think historically has been communicated well enough to patients, which is that insulin, while an amazing and important hormone, is not benign. And there's a big difference between taking 100 units of insulin a day to achieve normal glycemia and taking 20 units of insulin a day to achieve normal glycemia. And you'll take the latter over the former all day, every day, non-negotiable. Um, and some patients will say, well, gosh, I'm still on insulin. This hasn't worked and not realizing, no, you've had a five fold reduction in your insulin requirement. That's an enormous improvement in your health outcome. Not, and, and let's put the economics aside. The economics are enormous, but ignore that for a moment, just in terms of health outcomes, uh, the, the negative effects of hyperinsulinemia. Um, yeah. And it, I just w w w want to say with that, you know, if we really think about the way we, we manage diabetes, okay, rather than work to actually reverse the disease process and get people off of medication, I mean, management constantly leads to more and more and more insulin, which we know, I mean, on the outward, the, the appearance of it is that people gain more weight when they go on more insulin. But you know, if we really get down to the nuts and bolts, when we take someone with type two diabetes whose glucose is out of control to the point where we need to put them on insulin, the mandatory discussion that needs to occur is, I'm gonna put this medication, I'm gonna give this medication, this insulin that you're gonna inject to you, okay? Um, and I'm gonna do that because your blood sugars are so high that they could acutely kill you. Okay, put you into the hospital, put you at risk of all these complications. But I just want you to know, you're more likely to die on insulin. That's what we need to tell people. That's the truth. And you know, that would have changed the approach a lot of patients want to take. And it would certainly, if, if, if providers were forced to look at it that way, when they're staring each individual person in the face, maybe they would treat it differently as well. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com dot com forward slash about 
where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. 